All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, we will go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. Now? Okay. All right, good morning. Uh, we will go ahead and start our uh, city council meeting. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, the July 21st, 2021 meeting of the city council is called to order. Uh, this meeting has been properly noticed and posted in compliance with the open meeting law. I'd like to note that the mayor is excused for today's meeting. Uh, these proceedings are being video recorded as well as presented live on KCLV cable channel 2 and are closed captioned for our hearing impaired viewers made possible through the underwriting from the Warren group of companies. Uh, please note customers of Cox Communication can view this program in high definition on channel 1002 and in standard definition on channel 2. You can also watch this meeting live on Apple TV, Roku and Amazon Fire TV on the Go Vegas app. The city council meeting as well as all other KCLV programming can be viewed on the internet at www.kclv.tv slash live. The proceedings will be rebroadcast on KCLV channel two in the web, uh, the Wednesday of the meeting at 8 p.m. and also on Friday, 4 a.m., Saturday, 7 p.m., Sunday at 7 a.m. and the following Monday at 5 p.m. Uh, this building is protected by state-of-the-art fire detection and suppression sprinkler system. If alarms should activate during today's meeting, please evacuate during, using the exits at the back of the chambers out to the mezzanine and pr proceed out the double doors to the terrace and down the back staircase. For anyone that has difficulty with stairs, please check with a marshal or fire official for assistance. Once outside, assemble on the northeast corner across the street from City Hall at Lewis and First Street. Employees wearing safety vests or city marshals will inform you when it's safe to re-enter the building. For public comment related to the items on the agenda, citizen participation and public hearing items, we have available a speaker card, which you can complete and submit to the city clerk. Car car cards are available in the clerk's office or at the rear chambers. If you did not submit a card, it does not prevent you from speaking under public comment, citizen participation, or specific public hearing items. If there's anyone present today that has a need for hearing impaired equipment, uh, please see the city clerk. Uh, if you parked in the uh, parking garage across from the street, a self-validation machine is located in the foyer between council chambers and the security desk you walk through to enter these chambers. You must have a ticket when you use the machine. If you do not have a ticket, seek uh, security personnel when exiting for a validation coupon. Before we proceed with the agenda, would everyone please rise for the invocation given by Rabbi Anderson, young Israel Ash of Las Vegas, and please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Almighty God, as the City Council convenes, we pray for the continued reopening of our city and recovery of our community. We recognize the uncertainty of our times and pray for the strength to live with that uncertainty. Moses requests of God, make your ways known to me, and God answers, no human can see me and live. Great people can continue to live and even to lead without having all the answers. Yet, while we acknowledge that there is so much that we do not know, God tells Moses, you will see my back, but my face may not be seen. In other words, you may not understand why things are happening, but we must always look back and learn from our experiences. Successful leaders are always learning, knowing that everything happens for a reason. While we cannot explain theodicy or challenges, we must always ask ourselves, what can we learn from that experience? Elie Wiesel said, when he created mankind, God gave him a secret, and that secret was not how to begin, but how to begin again. Almighty God, grant the city council members the resilience to lead with confidence and determination, especially during these times of continued uncertainty. We pray that you help city council members to continually provide principled leadership, and especially in difficult moments, let us remind ourselves that the secret is how to begin again. And let us say, Amen. Okay, we'll now go down to the front and do our ceremonial.
All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, this uh, part of our city council meeting is where we recognize some uh, very important and influential uh, people in our community, and we have uh, two of those individuals today. Uh, the first one, uh, I would like to invite Municipal Court Administrator Jack Esslinger to join us at the podium. Jack, give him a nice round of applause. This uh, recognition is our employee of the month. Our employees strive to meet our values of being kind, committed, and smart, and they work to build our community to make life better. I'm proud to announce that the employee of the month is Michael Yandrick. Michael, please come down here. Where's Michael? Oh, come on down, Michael. <laughs> Was this a surprise? It was uh, when I found out last week. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. A surprise for a week, a week ago. Okay. Um, this, is, uh, this is quite a story I'm about to read you. Earlier this year, Municipal Court Marshal Yandrick, while off duty and not in uniform, was enjoying dinner at a local establishment. While having his meal, a customer at the bar was inebriated and started to get loud and aggressive with other patrons. Michael observed the staff getting nervous, so he and another patron escorted the man out of the estab establishment to defuse the situation. That's a, uh, a typical cop <laughs> taking, care, taking care of business. The man re-entered the establishment. Michael approached the man and asked him to leave. The man swung his fist at Michael, but barely hit his chest. Michael kept his arms at his side and attempted to defuse the situation. The man then reached into his hoodie and withdrew a pistol and pointed the gun directly at Michael. Michael was able to disarm the man who fired one shot that thankfully did not strike anyone. Metro police soon arrived and took over the situation. Unfortunately, Michael broke a bone in his hand during the incident. Michael demonstrated outstanding courage in this confrontation and truly lived the city's values. Michael kept his cool and attempted to de-escalate the situation verbally. When the man pulled out the gun, Michael used his training to protect himself and others in the establishment. Michael, thank you for t protecting this community. Thank you very much, we appreciate it. And uh, now I'm gonna turn over the microphone to uh, Jack Islinger and then uh, we're gonna hear from Michael, so Jack. Uh, we just want to say thank you to Michael for doing such a fantastic job uh, in, in the face of adversity. He handled the situation. You couldn't ask for it to be handled any better. Try to defuse the situation as best you can. And when it became time to take action, Michael took action. I don't think you can ask for more than that. So thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. All right. You're the man of the hour. <laughs> man of the hour, too sweet to be sour. I just want to thank uh, Jack and uh, Sergeant Martino, who's not here, for uh, nominating me for this award. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> 20 years pays off. Now look at that. <laughs> right? Um, uh, I'd say um, recognition has, wasn't a strong point in previous administrations, but Jack Essinger and current administration have uh, made great strides in that. I work with a lot of great people that have done a lot of great things. We've had guys such as uh, Richard Kilgore, David Reyes lift a van off of a kid that was trapped under a van. Willis and Patino broke the window out of an inebriated driver rolling through an intersection, got him into custody. Bob Latham's leadership on October 1 at the coroner's office. So I work with a lot of great people and uh, they have, didn't get the recognition that I got today. So I work in good company and uh, appreciate you guys looking out. Thank you. You know, uh, I, I just want to say M Michael represents the, uh, the hundreds of thousands of police officers all over the country uh, that go through tra training and, and, and uh, take an oath to not only protect themselves, but to protect uh, the community that they serve. And whether it's on duty or off duty, they're the ones, the first ones to step up to make sure uh, that if something's going on, people are safe. So uh, thank you very much, and you represent 
the police officers throughout the country. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Good job. All right, I will now turn this over to the great councilman, uh, Cedric Creer. Hey. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today is a great day, a special day, uh, once again in the city of Las Vegas. And uh, I am going to ask my friend, my former colleague, uh, to come up here and join me, uh, Lawrence Weekly. Come on up. And I'm just going to get started because there's so much to say about this man. Uh, good morning, sir. <laughs> you know, uh, this is a special day for us in the city of Las Vegas. And I just want to recognize former Clark County Commissioner Lawrence Weekly, former city councilman Lawrence Weekly, former employee of the city of Las Vegas. Um, I think he's probably done every job in the city in one way, shape, or form throughout his career. And it's just great to be able to recognize him. And I know everybody behind me uh, feels the same way, including the mayor who uh, can't be here today. So just a little bit about Commissioner, if you don't know. I don't know how you don't know, but if you don't know, he is a native Nevadan who lived in northern and southern Nevada. He grew up in Las Vegas on the west side and graduated from Western High School in 1982. <laughs> His higher education pursuit began at Clark County Community College, which is now the College of Southern Nevada. And he later transferred to Grambling State University in Louisiana, where he earned a Bachelor's of Communications in 1987. He also graduated from UNLV with a master's in public administration, and to add to his credit, taught classes at UNLV in public administration. And I know that he is currently working on his PhD as well, so soon we will be calling him Dr. Weekly. He returned to Las Vegas after graduating from Grambling and pursued a career in education at the Clark County School District and began his public radio broadcasting career. He soon found his way to public service and was employed by the city of Las Vegas as a management analyst in neighborhood services, where he was responsible for neighborhood outreach efforts and large community cleanups. In 1998, he was employed in the city council office to work as a liaison for former councilman Gary Reese. He was then appointed by former Governor Jim Gibbons to serve as a Clark County Commissioner, in which he served 13 years. Uh, he completed his final term just recently in January of, uh, of 2021. Uh, in between that, he was a city councilman, representing Ward 5, uh, the seat that I serve in, and so he paved the way for me to serve in this capacity uh, as well. He has been a, a friend and a mentor every step along the way in my entire career. Commissioner Weekly has worked with many organizations to provide leadership to at-risk youth groups. Uh, Commissioner has dedicated, dedicated his professional life to serving in public and especially youth through his involvement in many organizations. He's a member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, uh, as well as he is my fellow Archon in Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity Boulet, uh, and the founder of their leadership program, Camp Brotherhood and Camp Sisterhood. He served on many boards in his capacity as a county commissioner. He was the first African-American to serve as chair of the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority. He was a member of the UMC Hospital Board for 13 years, Workforce Connections, and the Clark County Liquor and Gaming License Board. And there are others that he served on. And I know he was a steadfast supporter of EOB as well throughout his career, and which oversees a lot of community um, activities as well as KCP Radio. Commissioner Weekly is well known and respected by the residents he served. And during his tenure in public service, he represented a large population of underserved residents to include foster and adopted children, the LGBTQ community, dreamers, and other underserved and marginalized groups who still looked for, to him for leadership. We cannot forget the seniors at Doolittle Senior Center, where he is affectionately known as Larry. <laughs> I know the Red Hatters love some Larry Weekly. <laughs> 
His long-standing role in the community is notable, and his work is commendable. Uh, Commissioner is a very humble person, and I want you all to know that he is uh, a hostile recipient today of this recognition. He didn't want it. But, uh, you know, people come through our communities and they come through our lives and we need to recognize those individuals that have made a huge footprint in our community. And this man behind me on my right is just one of those individuals. And although he accepted our invitation to be recognized, he does not want to belabor the city council's time recognizing the countless work and deeds he did to serve his community. Well, that's unfortunate because we already did it. <laughs> I'd just like to read a small portion of the proclamation that we have for Commissioner because it is, it is long. And so whereas, you know what, I'm gonna have you come up. I'm gonna hand this to you. Congratulations, my friend. It is a blessing to have you in our community and to uh, have served with you. And hopefully you won't forget me and continue to answer my phone calls when I need some help on some, on some, on some things. Uh, but the proclamation says, whereas Lawrence Weekly was appointed by former Governor Jim Gibbons after serving seven years as a councilman uh, to serve as Clark County Commissioner, and he served 13 years in his capacity and completed his final term on January 4, 2021. And whereas we honor Lawrence Weekly for his outstanding career in public office, he has a legacy of providing leadership with compassion to his community and his lifelong standing efforts deserve the highest accolades. And so now we the mayor and members of the Las Vegas City Council urge the entire community to join with us as we do hereby proclaim July 21st, 2021, Lawrence Weekly Day in the city of Las Vegas. Thank you. And a shout out to his family, his beautiful wife, Kim, Malik, Kenya. I know they are watching and uh, he wouldn't be anything if it wasn't for his family supporting him. So, Commissioner, thank you, brother. Thank you so much. I want you to say a couple words. I know you got that deep baritone voice. I know we got matching ties on. You got that voice that's going to resonate that you, that you can always find them on KCP Radio every Saturday morning. Uh, so, please, Commissioner. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, City of Las Vegas. Uh, Councilman Creer, thank you. Can we give him a round of applause, please? Please, please, please. Hey, Don. How are you? First of all, I want to just really take this time to just thank God. I'm so very blessed in my life. I'm so grateful. When I think of how my life began, it didn't begin on the easy side of the road. Being born indigent, um, being um, thrusted into the foster care system at two days old, um, I always send a message out to young kids and those that are in foster care, those that live in public housing, particularly um, Councilwoman Diaz, um, Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority, that it's not where you start, it's how you finish that counts. And I can tell you that it was this village that stepped in. It was two people who wanted a child, and um, God saw fit to give them me. And I'm so very grateful that he did, uh, because through all the trials and tribulations that we had gone through in my family, um, this is what molded me to be the person that I am today. Um, working here at the city of Las Vegas, uh, for those, um, and I look back, I see Tom Perigo and, uh, and of course, Jorge and, and Lisa. And some of those, all of you guys who were here with us, Brian, when we worked over on um, Stewart. And um, my office was in the basement. That's where it was. Neighborhood services was down in the basement. And, you know, I just remember one day having to take a document up to the mayor's office. And I just remember getting off the elevator. And as I got off the elevator, Don, the carpet felt a little different. <laughs> and I said, wow, I'd love to walk on this carpet one day. And someone in the basement told me, don't even think about it. You'll never get there. And lo and behold, the state legislature mandated that the city council be expanded. And Oscar looked over at me one day and said, hey, how'd you like to become a councilman? And I said, Oscar, I'm striving to make $50,000 a year. I, the council only makes $43,500. I'm going backwards. Y'all <laughs> need to pay me for this job, Stavros. And lo and behold, I became a councilman. And it was one of the best things that happened in my life. I had some of the best times of my life. As a matter of fact, Kim gave me a picture real quick. And I'm going to hurry because i got to get out of y'all's way. But Kim, thank you for this. This just reminds me of the old days. You know, these are the OGs of the city council, you know. <laughs> And, you know, it, it, it's such a blessing to be here, and I, and I can't tell you enough. And when Tanya, who is just, oh, my God, she, she's tough. I didn't want to be here today. Um, 
As you guys can see, I didn't even invite my family or anybody. I didn't even tell them I was coming here today. And so they probably all side-eyeing me right now. But this is such a blessing. I just want to thank everyone uh, for this opportunity. And Councilman Creer, this is going to go down in history. Uh, this will be one that's um, definitely going to be um, in my office. I'm so grateful to what I do now. Uh, retiring from um, public office um, is awesome. Uh, to pass the torch on to the next generation of um, young political leaders, um, like you young people that's up here today, God bless you all, because this is a very tough time where you all are having to make decisions uh, during a global pandemic uh, that's affecting lives every single day. And I know it's not easy. So I want to thank you for your service. But I also, too, Councilman and Mayor Pro Tem, if you don't mind. And thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I play pickleball now. And thank you for what you do for us. <laughs> thank you for what you do for us over at Durango Park. And I understand you're going to close our park Tuesday and Wednesday for upgrades. Thank you. <laughs> we love you up there, Durango. We say your name all the time. But uh, you, you don't want any of this, Councilman. Trust me, I'm good at pickleball now. Stay in your lane, Councilman. Real quick, I just wanted to thank a couple of people, and Don is going to help me out. I, she's not here today, but I wanted to thank, um, I bought a couple of little small tokens. Bring all four of them. Bought something. I wanted to give the mayor something to just tell her thank you. Mayor Goodman and I, we go way back. She's been a great friend to me and a great supporter. I um, just wanted to give her uh, her flowers and just tell her thank you. I think it's so important that you give people their flowers while they're around to smell them. And I just wanted to thank her. Secondly, Tanya, please come up here and accept these uh, flowers. Thank you. Um, Okay, let me see. This is the this is this is the mayor's. Okay, can you make sure you put that in her office for me, Tanya? Can you get that one to Tanya for me, Tanya? Thank you, sweetheart. I appreciate you so very very much. Thank you for all you've done. You've been a great supporter of mine over the years. I appreciate you, Dr. Lisa Morris Hibbler. Could you please come and accept this, please? Thank you so very much. I can't thank you for being a blessing in my life. Here you go. And lastly, my Power 88 little sister, wow. Lady AK. I saw you in the parking lot, and I was hiding because I didn't want you to see your flowers. But I wanted to just publicly thank you for your support as well. We love you as well. This is, we got to go. We got to go. Thank you, City of Las Vegas. God bless you all. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think Commissioner Weekly left, right? I, you know, my, thank you, my friend. We're going to take a picture. Okay, we'll start our meeting right around uh, 9.30. Thank you very much.
All right, good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and start our uh, city council meeting. Before we do that, though, I just want to recognize our uh, National Collector Car Appreciation Day. If, uh, I'm sure you noticed out in front of City Hall, we have uh, quite a few uh, collector cars, historical cars and classic cars that uh, have been renovated to pristine condition. And I want to thank uh, Skeeter Raider and all his uh, men and women out there that spend all year long making sure that our history and our culture of uh, cars are intact. And there were supposed to be 56 vehicles out there today, but uh, um, as many of you know, including myself, I have a 2014 uh, uh, Chevy Corvette. You do not drive those kind of vehicles when it possibly is going to rain because you can't get a raindrop on them. So we had about half the car show up from a 1929 Ford Roadster and Mercedes Gazelle Roadster to a 2020 Ford Mustang. So those vehicles will be out there till uh, 1030 and uh, the owners are proud to show them off and uh, especially the muscle cars. So uh, thank you to the National Collector Car Appreciation uh, folks for bringing their cars out today. All right, agenda item. Number seven is public comment. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. Uh, the, amount any, uh, 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 the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. All comments made may be cross-referenced to those specific items. If anyone submitted a speaker card or who wishes to speak under this portion of the agenda, please come to the podium and state your name for the record. This is your opportunity to address the council on a specific agenda item. Uh, but the council is not able to respond or engage a dialogue. We'll set the uh, time at one minute. So does anyone want to speak on a particular agenda item uh, this morning? Okay, I will uh, close public comment and we'll move on to agenda item number eight for possible action. Uh, any items from the 930 session that the council staff or the applicant wish to be stricken, tabled, withdrawn, or held in abeyance to a future meeting uh, may be uh, brought forward and act upon at this time. Councilwoman Fiore. Um, thank you. We are going to the following items have been requested to be held in abeyance, withdrawn, or stricken. Item 15, a parking lease agreement between 1621 South Main LLC and the city of Las Vegas regarding a 60 space parking lot located at 1621 South Main Street. A strike is requested by the applicant. Item 53, closed session to receive information from the city attorney about potential and existing litigation. A strike is requested by staff. Items 63A and 63B, 20-0344-GPA1 and 20-0344-Zone1. The applicant owner SWDE348 LLC on 44.52 acres on the west side of the Rainbow Boulevard alignment, approximately 6,900 feet north of Horse Drive. The applicant requests an abeyance to August 4th, 2021 council. Item 64A and 64B, 21-0230 um, SUP1 and 21-0230 SDR1. Applicant Safe Store Real Estate Company, LLC, owner Northwest 95, LLC on 2.79 acres at the northwest corner of Osa Blanca and Durango Drive. The applicant requests an abeyance to August 18th, 2021 on our city council. End item 65, 21-0231-VAR1, uh, applicant owner, Patrick Bailey on a quarter acres at 5136 La Majan Court. Applicant requests an abeyance to August 4th, 2021 on City Council. And that will be my motion, Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Fiore. We have a motion. Go ahead and vote and post. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, also, just as a reminder, uh, uh, Mayor Carolyn Goodman is excused from uh, our meeting today. Uh, item number nine is uh, for possible action to approve the final minutes uh, by reference to the June 16, 2021 regular city councilwoman, Councilwoman Fiore. Yes, Chairman. Yes, I move to approve the minutes of the June 16, 2021 city council meeting. Thank you. We have a motion. Go ahead and vote and post. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, item number uh, uh, 10, item numbers 10 
through 36 with the exception of item number uh, 15. That's the only one, right? And number 15 on the consent agenda are considered to be routine, are recommended for approval by the departments and be enacted in one motion. Uh, are there any other items uh, that the city council would like to bring forward or amend? We do have one comment down here, yep. uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Jeff Dorkak, Assistant City Attorney for the record. On consent item 10, the proposed allocation of opioid recoveries, as we alerted the council yesterday, the Attorney General's office has updated that proposed agreement, and for the record, it has been given to the clerk's office, and it will be added to uh, the, the meeting agenda and minutes. The proposed agreement, as we alerted everyone yesterday, updates the city's allocation in the local government allocation pool from 3.98, it goes to 6.835. So just for the record, the updated agreement will be in the agenda and everything is good to go on item 10. Very good. Um, do I have a motion, Councilman Fiore? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem, Chairman, I move to approve consent items 10 through 36 with the exception of item 15. Thank you. I have a motion, go ahead and vote. <clears throat> And post. Motion carries unanimously. Consent agenda item is approved. All right. All right, we will now go to agenda item 37. Uh, this is an abeyance item presentations by KGA, LGA, and Steelman Partners and discussion for possible action regarding the selection of an offer and authorization to begin contract negotiations for design services of RSOQ 210186-J J Henry, the downtown Civic Center building and plaza, which will be located on a parcel bounded by Bonneville Avenue, Main Street, Clark Avenue, and First Street. This is in Councilman Diaz's uh, district. Uh, presentations for this item were uh, presented on uh, June 16th, so I will turn this over to uh, our city manager, Jorge Cervantes, to begin the discussion. Good morning, morning Mayor Pro Tem and Council. Uh, as you mentioned, Mayor Pro Tem, this is an abeyance item from the June 16th meeting in which we had three architectural firms come give presentation on the potential vision for a civic plaza across the street from City Hall. And so just to refresh a little bit of how we got to this point, back in March 16th of this year, we did a, uh, we, we submitted a statement of qualification request to all the architectural firms to submit on a proposal to do design services for the city that included a uh, civic center open space across the street as well as some additional office space for city needs. Uh, of that, we had 13 submittals that came in on April 14th. Of uh, those 13 submittals, there was a group, a uh, validation committee was comprised of representatives from various departments that reviewed those. After reviewing those against the scope of the request for submittal, uh, seven firms were uh, nominated to move forward to the next step. Those seven firms came before this evaluation committee and made a presentation on what their proposals were. Those in turn were whittled down to the top three firms that were presenting to, were moving forward to present to city council. Those included the firm of KGA Inc., uh, LGA Architecture and Steelman Partners LLP. And so those three finalists were the ones that came before you on June 16 and made their presentations on what their vision is. Um, several of you have asked me what my recommendation would be on that. You all saw what the presentations were. And so in giving you my recommendation, what I did is I went back to what originally started this project several years ago. If you recall back about three, four years ago when we did the 2045 downtown master plan, one thing we heard over and over at the outreach meetings was that if city, if you want to continue to have redevelopment, residential redevelopment downtown, then you really need to provide park and open space so that more people want to live downtown. And so with that, we came before council, we made a presentation, and we recommended three ways to get there. One way is we could build urban trails downtown that connect areas. The second way is we could create pocket parks throughout downtown, small areas where people could use for a gathering, or we could create more of a centralized park, a bigger area. The direction from council at that time was, well, we want to see all three of them, so let's find a way to provide all three of those amenities for our residents downtown. Uh, we've been doing that over time. Uh, we just finished the, doing the the one park that's next to the Healing Garden. Uh, we've been, been building smaller pocket parks and working on our trail system. And we started at that time to assemble the block across the street with the intent of creating more of a civic plaza space where people could have that type of amenity for downtown residents. And so with that vision, we had three architecture firms that came forward. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, three of the best architecture firms in our community that provided some great ideas on what could happen across the street. 
But as I looked at it from my perspective, I said, you know, what was the intent of that block? And it really was how do we create that civic space that could really be utilized by the community? And two of the firms really focused on that area in their presentation. It was the firm of KGA and LGA that had a focus on the, on the public realm. The firm of Steelman did a great job in a beautiful building, but the focus in my mind was really how do we capitalize on that open space and create that amenity for our community. And so those two firms, in my mind, rose to the top. And then of those two firms, one of them stood out a little bit more than the other, and here's the reason why. Our intent always was to have a facility across the street that's similar to a Bryant Park that several of us and some in council went a couple of years to look at, a place that's constantly programmed so there's activities going there. And so we're looking, as we build this park, that we look for a not-for-profit partner that can manage that park on our behalf, that could do constant programming, whether we're having a farmer's market, whether we're having yoga in the evening. There's constant activity out there, so it's really an active area. And one of the firms brought that expertise to the table. As they made their presentations, they have, as part of their partnership, a firm that established a pri private partnership in the park in Dallas that has stood it up and operated. So in my mind, that firm had that competitive edge, and that was the firm of LGA Architecture. So with that, my recommendation is that we give this contract to LGA, and we look for counsels directing through a motion on which firm you'd like to select. All right, thank you. Um, I, I will eventually uh, turn this over to Councilwoman Diaz to make a uh, motion. However, at this time, I'd like to invite anyone on the City Council who would like to make a comment, anything. Okay, Councilwoman Diaz. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I, I first want to thank everyone who went through the process, who applied the 13 applicants, then the seven, then the three finalists. I think that all of you brought some really amazing ideas, some really amazing concepts for us to consider as a city council. And I just want to also make the public aware that the renderings that were presented during the meeting aren't necessarily the final renderings of that civic plaza across the way. So today, the decision that is before this council is who's going to be our partner in solidifying this vision that our community wants to see materialize. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go with our city manager's recommendation because I think this team has amazing expertise in keeping us green and um, just making sure that our carbon footprint is minimized and it, our, we're sustainable over time, that we're activating that plaza in a way that hopefully will help us recoup the cost to keep it up um, and uh, that it will be a product that we'll all be proud of at the end of the day. So Mayor Pro Tem, I move to um, go with the LGA architecture company and, and uh, partners for this Civic Plaza across the way. Very good. Okay, we have a motion. Go ahead and vote and post. Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, uh, LGA Architecture, right over there. And and I, I also want to echo what uh, our city manager said. All, all three uh, uh, companies were absolutely outstanding. They gave a great presentation, a great vision of, of what they thought the plaza should uh, look like based on their expertise. Uh, I think we would have been great going to all th any one of them, uh, but uh, I, I, I do believe LJ rose to the uh, occasion. So can you just uh, give us an idea of what happens from this point on, just so the we know and the public knows uh, what, how we move forward with this uh, uh, open space? Certainly, Mayor Pro Tem. So with this direction from council, we'll start negotiating negotiate an agreement with the contract to start design. That usually takes about a month to go through the paperwork, get it through the different attorneys, and sign a contract. Uh, once we do that, we'll start the design process. It'll take usually something like that. It's about 12 to 14 months to the design process. Uh, we're constructing this in three phases, although we may combine two phases. Phase one will be to clear the site. There's a lot of underground overhead utilities. There's also an alley we've got to vacate and remove those utilities from there. So we'll start that probably ahead of time. As soon as those design contracts are ready, we'll start that portion first. Then we'll start with phase two, which is actually building the civic space and the first building. There's a second bill in this program there, which would be phase three, but depending on the availability of funds, we may combine phase two and phase three. One of the things we we're waiting for was for the sale of the DSC, which is on the agenda for today, to use those revenues to be able to accelerate phase three. So we'll probably break ground in construction. We're thinking about 12 to 14 months, we'll break ground in construction. Great, um, th this, is a, uh, this is a huge deal for downtown and, and uh, I just want to thank uh, Oscar and Carolyn Goodman for uh, having a vision to do this. So, 
LGA, did you want to make any uh, final comments, or you're re just ready to go to work, huh? We're ready to go. Okay, all right, very good. All right, thank you very much, and uh, we will now move on to uh, item number 38, uh, discussion for possible action regarding the ratification of Randy Robeson as the director of the Office of Government Affairs and Community Affairs. So, uh, Jorge Cervantes. Uh, for the record, Jorge Cervantes, City Manager. Uh, it's my pleasure to bring for your consideration the ratification of uh, Randy Robinson for the Director of Government and Community Affairs. Uh, just a little bit about Randy himself. He's uh, a native from Southern Nevada, being born and raised in Mesquite. Uh, he's been a lobbyist and a government affairs professional for many years. Uh, he came up through to us from CenturyLink, where he was Director of State Legislation and Government Affairs. Prior to that, he, ha he was the owner and president of Capital Strategies, which is a full-time government affairs and legislative advocacy firm. He's represented industry associations in education, local government, construction, finance, and small business. He's also the former executive director of the Nevada Association of School Boards and Nevada Association of Superintendents. He holds a Bachelor's of Art in Political Science from Brigham Young University, and he's active in the community, including uh, serving on several uh, not-for-profit organizations. And so with that, it's my recommendation that we ratify Randy Robinson as our Director of Government Affairs. Very good, thank you. Um, any questions or comments up here? Do I have a motion? Yeah. Motion to approve. All right, we have a motion. Go ahead and vote. And post. Oh, it's unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Randy, you want to say anything? Yes, Mr. Mr. Randy. Go ahead and say something. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, for the record, Randy Robinson, uh, now Director of uh, Government Affairs for the City of Las Vegas. Um, uh, very humbling privilege. I, I appreciate it very much and looking forward to doing some uh, great work on your behalf. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Congratulations. All right, moving on to uh, item number item number 39, discussion for possible action to approve filing an appeal or a writ petition in the Nevada Supreme Court relating to a decision granting a petition for judicial review entered in uh, resource transition consultants versus City of Las Vegas, uh, case number A2080-8277 in the 8th Judicial District Court. Mr. Scott, did you want to say anything on this or no? Uh, I can jump in if oh. they need. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, Jeff Dorkak, Assistant City Attorney, this is the required agenda item, so our office can go ahead and file an appeal or writ on this case. Um, as required by law, we have to put it before the council. Everything's in order for the item, and we would recommend that we are able to file. Okay, very good. Any questions or comments up here? City you Attorney Brian Scott here for the record. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Okay. All right, do I have a motion? Motion to approve. All right, we have a motion. Go ahead and vote and post. All right, motion carries. Thank you very much. On to item number 40, discussion for possible action regarding the uh, Neighborhood Partners Fund Board recommendations to allocate $39,142.30 for 11 neighborhood projects. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. Yep, you're on. Good morning. Kathy Thomas, Director for the Office of Community Services. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair for NPF was not able to be here today, so I will run through the committee's presentation. A quick background uh, about NPF program. It is focused on four key areas uh, designed to encourage neighborhoods to take an active role in their community. So we look at physical improvements, public safety, cultural and recreational or educational activities that are led by community members. 
This program grants up to $5,000 to registered neighborhood associations, and that includes homeowners associations. And these funds are matched by the neighborhood through uh, cash or volunteer hours, donated supplies and equipment, or pro professional services given pro bono to the community. This program has existed for the past 23 years, and in that time, more than $4 million have been invested in city neighborhoods, and that is through a, a very aggressive match. So $1.3 million in city funds and an additional $3.3 million uh, in investment through volunteer business sponsorships and in-kind donations. This year, the Neighborhood Partners Fund Board is recommending 11 neighborhoods to receive funding for projects that total $39,142.30, with a total match of $65,603.80. The board consists of 13 members that are appointed by the mayor and council, and these members review and evaluate all of the projects and propose the final funding recommendations to the city council. Uh, Vicki Quinn is the chair, and she sends her request that she cannot be here, and Chance Bonaventura is the vice chair. The members uh, as appointed by council this year include Vicki Quinn as the chair, uh, Gail Qualey, Larry Schultz, David Cress, Matt Tramp, Jared Glover, and Susie Ferre. And in addition, um, each council office also has a staff team member participating. Uh, this includes Sally Christensen, Chance Bonaventura, Tanya Jackson Renter, Carl Catarata, and Brianna Ramirez, and Ido Itaralde. We did have projects from all wards this year. <clears throat> they span uh, th three critical areas, sa public safety, neighborhood improvement, and community engagement projects. I'll go briefly through each of the projects and the award amount and the match amount. From Ward 1, we have the El Camino Community Association, which is doing a welcome bulletin in Small Garden. Their award amount is $5,000, and they are matching 4680 Also in Ward 1 is the Glen Heather Estates with a block party. Their award amount is 2540 Their match amount is 6924 Rainbow Family Park Neighborhood Association is doing neighborhood signage. Uh, they are uh, awarded $2,500 with a match of $3,220. Ward 1, Spanish Oaks Homeowners Association is doing a community movie night. Their award amount is $2,576.50 with a match of $6,188. In Ward 2, we have Scarlet Canyon Homeowners Association, and they are doing a turf conversion with an award of $4,785 and a match of $6,260. West Mesa Estates Neighborhood in Ward 2 is doing some uh, speed sign rentals with an award of $1,300 and a match of $3,674. In Ward 3, the Huntridge Neighborhood Association is doing a community engagement party with an award amount of $2,440.80, and their match is $4,004. The South Shores Community Association in Ward 4 is doing a block party. Their award amount is $5,000 with a match of $16,411. Tanglewood Homeowners Association in Ward 4 is upgrading their playground equipment. Their award amount is recommended at $5,000. Their match will be $8,522.80. In Ward 5, the Greens Homeowners Association is doing some sidewalk upgrades. The recommended award amount is $5,000. They will have a match of $2,600. 
in Ward 6, the Hillstone Estates Homeowners Association is doing a neighborhood watch event and upgrading uh, rock iron fencing. Their uh, recommended award amount is $3,000 with a match of $3,120. The total recommendation coming to you today for your approval is $39,142.30. Uh, well, they did this, so I don't want to acknowledge myself, but the board wants to thank <laughs> the mayor and the council <laughs> and city staff. Um, there is additional information av available about this program uh, on the city's website, and our next recruitment cycle begins uh, January 22, when the new applications will be available at that website. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to respond. Uh, well, first of all, you should acknowledge yourself. You do a lot of work, so thank, thank you very much. Um, any questions or comments from the City Council? Do I have a motion? Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. My motion to approve this item. All right. We have a motion to approve staff's recommendation. Go ahead and vote and post. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And good luck to all the wards with their projects. Okay, item number uh, 41 is uh, resolution R35-2021 discussion for possible action regarding a resolution for an agreement of purchase and sale and joint escrow instructions between the City of Las Vegas and DFA LLC for the property located at 333 North Rancho Drive, Councilman Creer's Ward. And uh, all right, go ahead and listen to the up. presentation. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem and members of Council, Ryan Smith, Acting Director of Economic and Urban Development for the record. Uh, I'm thrilled uh, to present this item today for the purchase and sale agreement of uh, the former DSC building, the Ahern family of companies. Uh, before I get started, I did want to thank a few different people, um, specifically Steve Kessler from our purchasing department, uh, Aaron Sibelius and Jen Davies from Communications, Nick Niarcos um, from from legal, and I know he's in the audience today, and then specifically Julie Quisenberry from our team. Uh, as you heard earlier uh, from Jorge, uh, the city is looking to consolidate operations close to uh, our building here at City Hall, and with that, it led to our need to sell the former DSC building. Uh, in February of 2021, we did an appraisal on the property. Uh, we issued an RFO in March, a uh, request for offers, uh, we marketed the property nationally. We did tours, we held webinars uh, to educate the community on how to put in an offer for this property. Um, with that, we received two proposals, two offers. Uh, we had a review committee that ultimately made the recommendation to select the offer from, from the Ahern uh, companies for $17.5 million. Um, we're asking for the approval today of, of this agreement and that will trigger a series of events. So uh, the Ahern companies will have about 30 days to do uh, uh, some feasibility studies, uh, and we're, we look to close in the next 90 days. Um, you know, I, going back to when we were originally thinking of the best uses for this building, uh, I think we were just hoping and dreaming that we would get a corporate headquarters uh, to locate in the building I know one of your major priorities is to diversify our economy. Uh, Ahern is one of the largest non-gaming employers in Southern Nevada, and they'll house over 800 uh, employees in the building. So it's an amazing project, and with that, I want to turn it over to Mr. Don Ahern to talk a little bit more about the project. Okay. Welcome. Well, thank you, Ryan. Appreciate that. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to- Go, go ahead and identif identify yourself, Don, just for the record. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, my name is Don Ahern. Thank you. Born and bred right here in Las Vegas. Uh, was birthed right here on Fremont Street, just so you know. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> anyhow, it, it is with great pleasure that I, that I get to stand up here before all you folks that work so hard as a city council. And uh, I'm uh, sorry that the mayor's not here today, but uh, because we love her a lot, and she's a wonderful lady and has been a great friend for many years. 
Uh, we uh, appreciate uh, Ward 5 and Councilman Cedric Greer for his efforts and support in this project and Mayor Pro Tem, good job, thank you as well. Um, Ryan and his team and Julie have done a great job of marketing this, this program. We evaluated many, many uh, nine-story buildings up and down Bonanza Road. We chose this one. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only one there, right? Okay, yeah, all right. But thank you very much to your team. Uh, we're very happy to. Uh, Don, we were all thinking, going, is it? Where's the other nine stories? <laughs> where, you, you caught us by surprise on that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. It's been a great run here. I'm, I'm almost uh, be 68 years old next month, and uh, it's really been a great city. Las Vegas is a wonderful place to have have been uh, born and raised here. So I've seen a lot of changes. I think there was 10 or 15 thousand people living here when when I was born, and my father uh, came to Las Vegas in um, probably in around 19. 40 something and uh, he had a degree in agriculture and worked for the uh, federal government right here. Uh, interesting, I hope you find it interesting, but you know where the mob museum is now. My dad's office was in that building under, he had a degree in agriculture and uh, had a um, office there for the county extension service, you know, to service the farmers. But we used to go up there as a family and sit on top of that building and watch the atom bombs go off. I mean, that's how time goes back, you know. But I, my, my team over here, who I'm very grateful to, that helped spearhead this thing, and they're hoping I don't ramble like I normally do. <laughs> so try not to embarrass anybody. But our first goal with this building is to relocate our uh, current corporate offices. We're kind of spread around Las Vegas and we have offices out in Henderson. We're gonna bring them all together right there. We would be very, very proud to have our worldwide corporate headquarters in Las Vegas right there. Where we, we have approximately 100 acres right there. And we have some big plans for this building and we'd like to share with you today kind of what we're gonna do. But we've got some new ventures that will be kind of expanding our array of things that we're involved with. Um, on this second page, I don't know if you, is that, uh, let's see here. Go back. There you go. No. Yeah, okay. Well, there's three guys right there, and you can tell the best looking one of the three. Uh, he hasn't quite developed fully yet, but that's my father, and that's the signal oil gas station. Okay, so I bet there's nobody in here who knows. That is the Stratosphere Tower property. And if you look kind of back in the background, you'll see Todd Kill Lincoln Mercury. Does anybody remember that? Those, those are the old days. And those two uh, girls up there, those are my sisters. Oh, wow. <laughs> they went to Las Vegas High School. For anybody that remembers the Rhythmettes. Anybody know about the Rhythmettes? No. Okay. <laughs> Time for me to die. <laughs> Anyhow. I think I'm the oldest one up here, Don, and I still wasn't born yet, so uh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna have to put you through the museum down there to figure all yeah, this absolutely. out. But as you can see, we're truly a family business, and uh, we have 26 different companies. We, we started right here in Vegas and uh, went all over the world, and as you can see, we're, we have international stores and manufacturing, and we, uh, did uh, last year about $1.33 billion. And we have nearly 4,000 employees worldwide now. So don't want to sound like we're bragging, but that's the headquarters that we're going to cover. And there's going to be people coming from all over the face of this earth to have meetings in this building. We're going to be very proud of Las Vegas. Thank you, Ryan. Um, the thing that we're probably most uh, excited to share with you is what we're going to do in this building. but. Um, first, I'd like to tell you some of the things we've done along there on Bonanza. We've spent several million dollars uh, kind of beautifying the street and doing different things like that. And for those of you who I know, many of you have been there. We have 3,500 
uh, fruit trees and a beautiful orchard right in there. And there's some apartments that we've just recently been able to get ownership in. So this new building is going to have nine, it has nine stories. Uh, we're going to, three stories are going to be dedicated to our headquarters and five stories are going to be dedicated to our program. And this building, you've, you've driven by it many times, this one in this picture here called the Academy. But we're expand, we did expand that last, uh, over a year ago to a truck driving school, a CDL school. We partnered with the College of Southern Nevada and we're going to continue to partner and now we call it the uh, ACT or the Advanced Career Training. So in this page, in this next page, you can, we'll just kind of move along here. You, you know the, the zone and, uh, and the spaces. So we're going to relocate a lot of that right up there and then we're going to uh, take some of those old apartments and we'll be coming back to you and we're going to try to turn those into a dormitory. And we're going to have uh, a bunch of different uh, types of training. We've already have got the uh, transportation and CDL, and we have the mechanics and all that. But we're going to expand it now with this building. We're going to go into construction, hospitality, equipment operations, safety, manufacturing, and equipment rental. So we're going to be the only trade school right there that's going to be able to uh, guarantee a job and not only with the Ahern family of companies, but with other companies around the uh, uh, town and within the county. We've already been talking to a lot of them. So we'll be placing people, but our, um, our objective is to set ourselves apart is that when a student comes to us that they've got a job before they start, not after they finish. So they've really got something to look at. We're also putting a staffing company down in the bottom so that these students can have jobs while they're going to school, either before or after. But in this picture, you can see some of our uh, big rig truck driving and so forth. And uh, this is all headed up by Mr. Lloyd Benson. I'd like to mention his name because he's kind of my mentor. I call him dad. <laughs> it's the only one in the room who's a little older than I am <laughs> by a few months. But uh, anyhow, this uh, advanced career training is really going to be a big part of what you're going to see over there. And if you notice in, in our paperwork there, you see uh, the School of Personal Development. Uh, we're going to be coming back to you. I want to plant a seed right now, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to convince the city on some methodology to solve some of our homeless problems. So we'll be coming back to you. We're going to, uh, Cedric, maybe you could uh, give me your ear at some point in the near future because I think there's some wonderful things we can do to make our city even a better city than it is. And with that, I'll say thank you and uh, any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Any uh, questions or comments up here, Councilman Fiore? Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I just really want to extend my gratitude for all uh, that the Ahern companies have done for the state of Nevada, for the city of Las Vegas, and throughout the world. Um, I'm, I'm just really grateful that you are here, born here on Fremont Street, and you have literally employed thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So thank you so much, Mr. Ahern, for everything you've done for the city of Las Vegas. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind yes. words. Councilman Seaman. Mr. Ahern, I just want to say, if people have not been to the orchard, or they need to tour it and understand how much of this city you guys are feeding. Um, I toured it, and I was so impressed at all you giving back. Uh, thanks to Lloyd Benson, he gave me a great tour. Yeah. So thank you guys for giving back. We appreciate it. You bet, uh, Councilman Seaman. We, uh, all the fruit, and I, I don't know what we're, I think this year we're 15, 20,000 pounds of fruit, and we, uh, we, we, the rule is nothing can be sold. It can only be given away to people in need, and uh, we have lots to give. Councilman Knutson. Mayor Pertem, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. I appreciate the rambling, and I like hearing the history of Las Vegas. Uh, and I, I very much appreciate your company and you and your investment in Las Vegas. I think it's really important that 
Um, we do everything to help companies thrive here. So thank you for your investment, because I'm sure it'll spur on other investment. And I drive by this building several times a day. I live less than, I don't know, a couple blocks away. Um, so it's, I'm really grateful for your investment and look forward to seeing everything that you'll do from it. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Councilwoman Diaz. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And uh, Mr. Ahern, first and foremost, thank you for uh, your generous bid for this uh, building. Um, we're so happy you're bringing all of your business into the city of Las Vegas, or a, a lion's share of it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're still going to spread the love to other municipalities, but I'm just looking at all of your partners that you work with, and I'm hopeful that we can continue to work together to make strides forward like, with workforce connections and making sure there's career pathways for everyone. And I love that we share that we're both born and raised here in Las Vegas. So um, again, thank, thank you. you so much. And I look forward to continued partnership and work with you. Thank you very much, Councilwoman. I appreciate that. And good job. Thank you. All right, Councilman Career. It's my turn. Uh, Ms. Ahern, uh, thank you very much uh, for looking at this building and to bring your corporate headquarters into the city. Uh, into Ward 5 and you know we go way back and uh, not only myself but with my mother and father and, I, mm -hmm. and with our community over Bonanza Village uh, as you know I too was born here and the, the church you showed on your slide shows Zion I was baptized at Zion oh. <laughs> yeah so you picked the you picked the right church to show yeah, yeah. and uh, you know it's just great uh, that that you are continuing to give back and to reinvest back into our community and the community that you have grown up in and, have, and, have, and, and live as well as I have to thank Mr. Lloyd Benson, uh, another Las Vegan who grew up in the neighborhood as well, right? And it's a shining example for all of us and anybody watching of how we all need to give back and to reinvest back into our yeah. communities. Um, we cannot do it alone. And if people are looking for government to solve all the problems of society, then they're going to be waiting a long time. Because we know that only by public and private partnership can we accomplish all of our goals that we need. And it takes private citizens like yourself to come up and say, I'm willing to take my time, my talent, and my treasures to reinvest back into our community. And so um, I personally thank you, not only as a councilman, but as a resident of Ward 5. And you know, we've already started discussions about collaborations of how we can work together to help address issues of workforce development and unemployment and getting people working and getting people trained, prepared, and ready to go to work in our community uh, with homelessness and also in conjunction with the uh, community farming facility we're looking to build at James Gate Park in partnerships with your orchard that you've built. Uh, you know, we're looking to work with that. Just so you know, Lloyd Benson has been a steadfast, uh, hard worker, and uh, you, maybe you can buy him lunch today because he has been uh, great to work with, and uh, we look forward to many more collaborations. And I know uh, the things that we have on the horizon are going to come quickly, and it's going to make a huge difference in our community. So. Thank you very, very much. And uh, if there's no other comment, I um, heartfelt uh, want to make a motion of approval for this agenda item. All right, we have a motion. Go ahead and vote. And post. Motion, go ahead and post it. I have my things green, yay. Uh oh, this is a bad omen. No, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> you, do you need a roll call vote? Oh, okay. All right. Posted motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you Take care. Much. Thank you very much. Okay. Item number uh, 42 will be trailed uh, when we get until we get to item number 54. Um, item number. 43 boards and commissions uh, discussion for possible action regarding the reappointment of uh, Councilman Victoria Seaman to the audit committee. Um, okay, I'll make a motion to reappoint Councilman Seaman to the audit committee. Go ahead and vote. And post. Yeah, it says green. Green A. That's crazy. 
Aye. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. We will now go on to uh, <coughs> item number 45, uh, uh, recommend committee uh, bills. 44. I'm 44. Oh, did I skip 44? All right, um, discussion for possible action regarding the appointment of nominee Russ Martin to Ward 2 Seat of the Parks Recreation Advisory Committee. Uh, Mr. Mike Henley occupied one of the Ward 2 seats and he has resigned. Mr. Martin is eligible and wishes to serve the remainder of Mr. Henley's term, which expires 2024. Councilwoman Seaman. First of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Henley for all he has served in Ward 2 for the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission. And I would like to make a motion for Russ Martin to be appointed to take his place. Thank you. We have a motion. Go ahead and vote. And post. Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, now item 45, recommending committee bills eligible for adoption at this meeting, uh, Mr. City Attorney, would you please read the bills? Bill number 2021-26, First Amendment, an ordinance to adopt the City of Las Vegas 2050 Master Plan, repeal the Las Vegas 2020 Master Plan, including the elements of the 2020 plan that have been added or amended since the plan's adoption, make corresponding adjustments to various provisions of LVMC Title 19 and provide for other related matters. Councilman Fiore, do I have a motion? Yes, Mayor Pro Tem. I move to approve as a First Amendment. All right. Go ahead and vote and post. Motion carries. Item number uh, 46. Uh, please read the bill. Bill number 2021-27, an ordinance to amend LVMC Chapter 2.26 <coughs> to establish provisions regarding senior municipal court judges and to provide for other related matters. Councilman Fiore. Mo move to approve. Thank you. Go ahead and vote and post. Motion carries. Item number 47, bill number 2021-29. Uh, could you please read the bill? Bill number 2021-29, an ordinance creating the City of Las Vegas, Nevada, Special Improvement District number 816, Summerlin Village 22, ordering a street project, storm sewer project, sanitary sewer project, drainage project, and water project within the City of Las Vegas, Nevada, and providing other matters related thereto. Councilman Fiore. Move to approve. Thank you. I have a motion to approve. Go ahead and vote and post. Motion carries unanimously. Item number 48, bill number 20. 21-30, if you could please read the bill. Bill number 2021-30, an ordinance concerning the City of Las Vegas, Nevada, Special Improvement District number 816, Summerlin Village 22, assessing the cost of local improvements against the accessible property benefited by the local improvements and providing other matters related thereto. Councilman Fiore. Move to approve. Thank you. Go ahead and vote and post. Motion carries unanimously. Item number 49, uh, bill number 2021-31. Could you please read the bill? Bill number 2021-31, an ordinance authorizing the issuance and sale by the city of its special improvement district number 816, Summerlin Village 22, local improvement bonds series 2021, approving the form of certain documents with respect to such bonds, ratifying action taken by city officers toward the issuance of such bonds, and providing other matters related thereto. Uh, thank you, Councilman Fury. Move to approve. Thank you. Go ahead and vote and post. Motion carries unanimously. Item number 50, uh, recommending committee bills eligible for adoption at a later meeting. Uh, uh, item, numbers, item number 50, bill 2021-28 will be heard at a later meeting. We will now move on to <coughs> new bills. Uh, items, uh, item numbers uh, 50, one and 52 bills Z 2021-1 and 2021-32 will be held, will be heard at the recommending committee meeting on Monday, August 2nd, 2021. 
City Attorney, would you uh, read the bills, please? Yes, sir. Bill number Z-2021-1, an ordinance to amend the official zoning map of the City of Las Vegas by changing the zoning designations of certain parcels of land to reflect and formalize rezoning applications previously approved by the City Council and to provide for other related matters. Bill number 2021-32, an ordinance to amend LVMC Chapter 19.04 to add a new section to provide procedures and standards by which parklets and streeteries may be established within public rights of way and adjacent to public sidewalks in order to provide certain amenities. To amend LVMC Chapter Chapter 19.18 to provide corresponding definitions and to provide for other related matters. Okay, uh, new bill Z 2021-1 and 2021-32 are assigned to the August 2nd, 2021 recommending committee. Uh, members of myself, Councilman Knutson and Councilman Fiore, uh, if any so designated are unable to attend, clerk's office will coordinate finding substitutes as necessary uh, at the mayor's direction. We will now move on to items Number three. Okay, we're on to item number uh, 54 and 42. Uh, we will take separate motions on each of these items, and I'll go ahead and read them both into the record. Uh, item number 54 is a public hearing and discussion for possible action regarding the approval of a market rent letter pertaining to the lease of uh, 6,000 square feet, City of Las Vegas owned retail space located at 355 Promenade Place, Suite B2 in the redevelopment area, uh, Councilman Creer, and uh, also the related item number 42, R36 2021 discussion for possible action regarding a resolution finding the retail lease of 6,281 square feet of a ground level commercial retail space between the city of, Las, uh, city of Las Vegas to VIX Symphony Park LLC for such property for the purpose of economic development. Item number 54 is a public hearing, so I'll declare that open. Uh, Mr. Smith, would you like, who's gonna, are you gonna start off, start us off? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Ryan Smith, Acting Director of Economic and Urban Development for the record. Again, proud to introduce another exciting item uh, for your guys' consideration today. Um, I, I want to thank Chris Loudon, who's here representing VIX LLC and his team behind him, and I'll turn it over in a little bit uh, to him to introduce the, the project. But just some facts around, around the, the lease terms and the deal. Um, the, this, the retail space is around 6,300 square feet. The concept would be a restaurant tavern. Um, Chris and his team will be investing over $2 million into the property. It is truly a, a gray shell. Um, the lease term will be over uh, 21 years and will collect around $4.25 million in lease payments. Um, and this project will really incorporate uh, Chris Loudon and his family's love for music, and it'll be a really iconic venue. Um, but I don't want to steal his thunder, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Chris to tell you a little bit more about the project. Uh, not much thunder. Uh, <laughs> well, good morning uh, and welcome, and uh, if you could introduce yourself and oh. uh, go ahead and tell us what you want to tell us. Well, I'm Chris Loudon, and uh, with, my bro uh, with me today is my brother, Paul Byron Martin, my CFO, Jerry, oh, and Mark DiMartino, for those of you who remember DiMartino's back in the day. Um, I probably should mention the, uh, the Tillerman, but DiMartino's is sort of, you know, how we all grew up. Um, so this project, uh, we had a, a project in mind um, we were going to call VIX, and a lot of it was uh, centered around the trademark that we own, which is the famous Vegas Vic downtown. And uh, the idea was that it would be more of a lounge and a little, not, not super high end, but a little bit more high end and focus on music, mostly acoustic style music. And uh, for some of you know, I'm in the country business, um, but we also do jazz, straight jazz. And we produce albums and uh, for those of you who don't know, my, my dad was an old Hammond B3 player, still is a Hammond B3-er and a monster at that. Um, took a break to do the casino thing and uh, now he's semi-retired. But um, so we had this idea that we, you know, we wanted to put someplace and it just sort of came up and uh, we're pretty excited. 
to be able to put this thing there. And it's, it's, I wish it was a little bit bigger, but it's not. Uh, so the idea here is, is that we would have a, uh, a little bit, you know, sort of higher end, kind of a la Houston's. Uh, if you've ever been there in, in California, it's a great restaurant. But Italian based um, with a focus on this entertainment. And it's straight, probably be mostly straight jazz. And uh, we also have a relationship with the LVA, so you know, Loud and Performing Arts Theater. And we really support the jazz kids and jazz program. Um, we just did some scholarships not that long ago. Um, but it's the idea is that we can get some of those jazz kids, and if you haven't heard them, they're phenomenal. Uh, get them over to the place at night, actually give them a paying gig. And, and let them play and then mix in with, you know, some cool stuff and some cool dudes. Uh, you know, guys like John Clayton and Joey DeFrancesco, all top of their game, make it a really nice facility. That's sort of our goal. The music portion, um, we can afford mostly because of the machines, and that, that's a perfect storm for us uh, to be able to create that, but, but still have it high end. Um, the bar will be separated by glass. And uh, the restaurant area, of course, is completely non-smoking, uh, both for the customers and the equipment. Um, and that's, I think that's it in a nutshell. Right? Didn't, didn't over, overplay it too much. This is my brother Paul, he has a few words. And uh, go ahead. Welcome, go ahead and identify yourself. Hi, Council. Uh, Paul Loudon, Jr. Um, I won't take up too much time. <laughs> I'm actually a member of uh, the Las Vegas Arts Commission, um, and uh, once in a while I get to sit where you guys sit, but not with the, not with the <laughs> fancy stuff. Uh, <laughs> I, I see what's going on uh, in all the areas around town. No secret that downtown is uh, healthy and busy. Um, the new arts district is exciting, uh, also healthy, growing. And I think Symphony Park uh, could actually be the next fun chapter uh, in the downtown area, and we'd really, uh, we'd really love to be a part of it. So, that was it. thank you. Anyone else uh, want to make a comment there? I'd like to bring up Myron, okay. since uh, Myron's probably the biggest player in Symphony Park uh, right now for us. Uh, we'll have to work together because that's a. Uh, they're definitely a symbiotic relationship there. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Council, uh, for the record, Myron Martin from the Smith Center. Uh, I, I have to first uh, share with you all that the Smith Center is reopening in September. And for those that may be tuning in, yes, we can't wait to reopen. <laughs> We're also very proud that uh, we just received uh, some of the Small Business Administration grants for shuttered venues, and uh, that money was actually wired uh, here uh, just in the last couple of days, which means that we're in the process of rehiring 166 people who will be returning to work in downtown Las Vegas. So we're proud of that. Uh, I'm proud of the city uh, for going out and finding people who, uh, like this, who are not only great restaurateurs and tavern owners, but they care about the arts. Um, to find someone who would put a restaurant and a tavern on the ground floor of a parking garage in Symphony Park is not for the faint of heart, and it's not for the inexperienced um, operator. These guys know what they're doing. They are regulars at the Smith Center, so they know uh, what it's like with traffic and parking and all those issues. They also know what it's like when the show's over and they'd like to go someplace and have a bite to eat and a drink. Uh, so they're gonna be providing that. So with that, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I uh, am here to say that the Smith Center is very excited and supportive of this motion. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, this is a public hearing. Anyone from the public wanna make any comments? Okay, I'll close the public hearing. Any questions or comments up here? Uh, Councilman Knutson. Thank you, Mayor Portem and uh, Councilman Creer. I'm a little jealous because all the, all the really great things right now are in today's meeting are for Ward 5. I just want to say I love going to the Smith Center. And in the mayor's state of the city, she had mentioned that I'm the, the partier of the city council, and that's absolutely <laughs> true. So I'll be there grabbing a drink before the show, going Please? to the show, and grabbing a drink after the show as well. So I look forward to it. Uh, and good luck and congratulations. I think it's Thank really you. exciting. 
Uh, Councilman Fury. So now our next step is to get Stonies in the city of Las Vegas. I'm just saying. You I'm know how much saying. I wish we were in the city, and we're working towards that goal. Yes, <laughs> we want you here in the city. All right, Councilman Career. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Chris, it's great to see you. Thank you for being here. And Chris, I've known for a number of years, <laughs> and it's just uh, nice to see you here with another great project, and, and Paul as well. Uh, you know, Loudon family has contributed to this community for decades. And uh, if you don't know who the Loudon family is and how they've contributed, I urge you to just do a Google search. And, I'm sure it'll be top of mind and top first uh, page because they have contributed so much to our community. And it's nice to see, once again, uh, here we have locals, uh, people that grew up in this community, looking to reinvest back into this community. Um, if you were here, you heard me say with Mr. Ahern, we need people. We need to you know, build our own community. We need to take ownership of our own community. That's exactly what you all are doing. Uh, this project is extremely exciting. Uh, like Councilman Knudsen, I'll be there as well. Uh, you know, save me a cold one because oh, I'll, yeah. be, I'll be looking forward to it. And it, you know, and it, it, it adds to everything else that we're doing downtown in Symphony Park with uh, the Marriott that's coming in, with the expansion of the World Market Center, with the apartments that are taking place, with Sutherland and Aspen Group, um, with other vendors that are coming into the parking garages, with the Ruvo Institute, and it's just creating this density uh, in the Smith Center. I can't forget the Smith Center, uh, my all-time favorite former board member, and very proud to say that. Uh, and it just adds to exactly what the vision of Mayor Oscar had uh, a while back of what it could be, because you and I both know that area was just a vacant piece of <laughs> land for a long time that was railroad track, and, and, and it was just, it sat nothing empty for, for decades, as oh, far as, you know, you and I grew up, it was always, <laughs> nothing there. it was nothing there, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it pretty is great to see the transformation that's taking place, and I would thank you for being a part of it. And, and I don't want to belabor, because we could talk for a long time, but uh, thank you, and I want to make a motion for approval. So uh, this you. is agenda item uh, 54 that you're making a motion? Item 54, All yes, All right, sir. go ahead and vote. And post, motion carries unanimously. And item number 42, please. Thank you all very much, and see you soon. Need a, yeah, yep. we have another corresponding item on item 42. Uh, I will make a motion for approval as well. Go ahead and vote and post. All right, now it's official. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. All right. Look forward to seeing you all. Absolutely. Okay, item number uh, 55 is on the consent agenda. is considered routine and recommended for approval by the Department of Planning. Councilman Fiore, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, item number 55? Yes, Mayor Pro Tem, a motion to approve agenda item 55. Thank you. Go ahead and vote and post. Motion carries. Item number uh, 56. Items number 56 through 62 may be considered in one motion, one vote, and are considered routine, non public, and public hearing items with no Condition changes, any person representing an application or a member of the public or a member of the council not in agreement with the conditions and uh, all standard conditions for the application recommended by staff should request to have that item removed from this portion of the agenda. Okay, item number 56, 21-0293 RQR1 applicant Lamar Central Outdoor LLC. Owner is uh, Integral Partners Park Place LLC on a request for a required review of an approved special use permit for an existing 14 foot by 48 foot off premise sign uh, oriented towards Interstate 15 at a height of 30 feet above the elevated freeway and a second 14 foot by 48 foot off premise sign oriented toward the Desert Inn Road super arterial at a height of 55 feet above grade at 3200 South Rancho Drive. Uh, this is uh, uh, C2 and is in uh, Ward 1, Councilman Knudsen. Item number 57, 21-0294, RQR1 applicant, Lamar Central Outdoors, owner, uh, Rebel Land and Development, on a required review of an approved special use permit 
U000597 for a, a 40 foot tall, 14 foot by 48 foot off premise sign at 1080 South Rainbow Boulevard. This is uh, C1, uh, Ward 1, Councilman Knutson. Item number 58, 21-0295RQR1, applicant Lamar Central Outdoors. Owner is C&J Prime Investments on a required review of an approved special use permit for a 55 foot tall, 14 foot by 48 foot off premise sign at 2550 Highland Drive, uh, zone industrial. Ward 1, Councilman Knutson. 59 is uh, 210296RQR1. Applicant Lamar Central Outdoors owner uh, Char West on a required review and approved special use permit for a 40 foot tall, 14 foot by 48 foot off premise sign at 4820 West Charleston Boulevard. This is uh, uh, C2 and Ward 1, Councilman Knutson. Item number 60, 210297RQR1, applicant Lamar Central Outdoors, owner DJS Development on a request for a required view and approved special use permit uh, for an existing 55 foot tall, 14 foot by 48 foot off premise sign at 3920 West Charleston Boulevard, uh, C1 and Ward 1, Councilman Knudsen. Uh, item number 61, 21-0298, RQR1 applicant, Lamar Central Outdoors, owner, Grammy Roberta, 1932 LLC, on a required review of an approved variance for a 40 foot tall, 14 by 48 foot off premise sign where such use was not allowed at 3920 West Sahara Avenue. This is C1, Ward 1, Councilman Knudsen. Item number 62, 21-0337, ROC1 applicant, ovation contractor, uh, owner, uh, Deer Springs Durango Apartments on a land use entitlement project, request for review of conditions of, approve, of approval numbers 18, 19, 20, and 23 of an approved site development plan review, uh, SDR 76995 on 9.1 acres on the south side of Deer Springs Way approximately 270 feet west of Durango Drive, uh, town center uh, zone, uh, UCTS Urban Center Mixed Use Town Center. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Fiore, Ward 6, staff recommends approval on all items. These are all public hearings. I'll declare them open. Anyone from the public wishing to speak on any of these items? Seeing none, I will. I'll close the public hearing. Councilman Creer. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Temp. Uh, just as a disclosure on items 56 through 61 uh, regarding Lamar Outdoor, um, I own an advertising billboard company, and uh, there is no conflict with me in our business, so I'll be voting on them. Thank you. All right, Councilman Fiore, do I have a motion? Yes, Mayor Pro Temp, I move for the approval of the one motion, one vote, items 56 through 62. Thank you. We have a motion, go ahead and vote and post. All right, that carries unanimously. We will now go on to item number uh, 66, reports, presentations. All right, reports, presentation, advance item, report by Jorge Cervantes, city manager regu uh, regarding the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, allocation of funds to the city of Las Vegas. Uh, Jorge Cervantes, thank you. Uh, for the record, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council, Jorge Cervantes, City Manager. Uh, this is a presentation to give you an update of where we are with the American Rescue Plan. And so just this way of a little bit of background, this uh, latest uh, funding was approved by President Biden on March 11th this year to go into effect that allocated $1.9 million to deal with some of the economic impacts as well as some of the health care impacts associated with the pandemic. This one actually builds on some earlier uh, allocations that were approved previously. The CARES Act was approved in March of 2020 and allocated $2.2 .2 trillion. A lot of focus of that money was really dealing more with the medical side of the pandemic and how we try to serve our community and keep, protect our community. But there was an additional appropriation, the Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2021, which passed late December of 2020, which allocated $900 billion, and that include items like rental assistance and, and also continuing with vaccination and uh, money for testing of, of uh, dealing with the pandemic. 
if we look at the appropriation of the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, there was uh, different categories that were funded through that. There was some direct payments that went to citizens at a level of $1,400, and this builds on the $600, $600 that were part of the previous plan for a total of $2,000 per, per individual that qualified based on, on income. But there was also a provision for child care credits that ranged from $3,000 to $3,600 based on the age of the children. It had some uh, additional money for the uh, expanded unemployment benefits that provide $300 of additional unemployment benefits, and that expires September 6th of this year. And then there was some money for small business assistance, uh, in including additional money for the payroll protection program, which allowed business to get money to be able to, to buy protective equipment for the employees, for the customers. And then specifically had some money appropriated for certain industry, certain businesses that were harmed the most as part of this business closure and other items. Uh, $25 billion went to restaurants and bars, which were very negatively, uh, negatively impacted, as well as performing arts. Uh, you heard Myron say that when the pandemic hit and they were required to shut down, there was a lot of people that were unemployed because of it. And so there was an, an allocation specifically for performing art venues. And then there was uh, $15 billion for economic uh, injury disaster loans. In addition to that, there was funding that was added to existing programs. These are programs that already existed within the federal government structure, but they added additional funding to be able to address some needs. Uh, Health and Human Services got additional money to continue their testing and vaccination efforts, uh, provide nutritional programs and, and help with community centers. Uh, the educational provision provided money for schools, and in particular, to try to open up schools again so we can get kids back to school this fall. There was money for, for housing provisions, including rental assistance, uh, dealing with homeless, and uh, helping homeowners pay not only for their mortgage, but also utility bills. And then aid to state and local governments. And today I'm going to focus really on the aid to state and local governments. Within, within the bill, there was uh, $350 billion that were allocated to state and local funding. Of that, the state of Nevada was allocated $2.7 billion. Uh, Clark County was allocated $439 million. And the city of Las Vegas was allocated $130 million. But in addition to that, there was also uh, money allocated some of the other governmental functions in, within the um, uh, communities, including Clark County School District, which received $835 million, and then the airport there received $171 million, and then RTCSO Nevada with $130 million. The so RTCSO Nevada in particular saw some real reductions in revenue because uh, people weren't coming, there was, casinos were shut down, and so they saw a big drop in their revenue yet they still need to provide uh, service. There's a lot of segment in our community that relies on mass transit to get to and from work. So as we had presented previously at some of our council briefings, uh, we were looking at some focus areas to concentrate this money on, and we identified four focus areas to kind of look at and see what opportunities there are to help our community. Uh, the first one being not-for-profits. We have a lot of not-for-profit partners out there that help us deal with some of the needs that help our community. Uh, we looked at affordable housing, which is becoming more and more of a challenge for us every day as we've seen the price of homes in our community start to increase and to the point where certain uh, people aren't able to afford housing anymore, particularly younger people, people starting off in their, in their profession. Uh, we looked at business assistance to help those businesses that really weren't assisted directly through the, through the bill but still have needs, and so focusing that money on, on those businesses that weren't getting direct allocations, and then the continued response to the public pandemic. So when we look at the not-for-profits, these are some of the areas that we're looking at, investigating, and see if there's opportunities there. Uh, we've been meeting with several community partners, which a lot of these not-for-profits, uh, including firms like Three Squares, Catholic Charities, which really do a lot of service in behalf of the community. And so we're looking at the opportunity for some direct financial contribution to help them continue to provide those services. This is in collaboration with, with some of the other local jurisdictions, Clark County and the state, because these, these not-for-profits have been reaching out to all of us. And one of the things we're trying to do is make sure we coordinate amongst each other so that we're not duplicating efforts. If, if one of the agencies is taking care of one of the needs, then there's no reason to duplicate those efforts. We're also looking at for workforce development, and you heard earlier from Mr. Ahern about some of the efforts he's doing. Uh, we're also partnering with the College of Southern Nevada to create a, a workforce development uh, center where it helps train some of the folks. One of the things that we're realizing because of this pandemic, certain industries that were there pre-pandemic may not be coming back, and if they do, they won't come back as robust. And so how do we grab that workforce and retrain to prepare them for those next opportunities that could come down? There's a big need in housing, uh, whether it's bridge housing for the homeless or taking care of our veterans, and then case management to be able to refer these folks to the right locations. 
And then education, uh, we talked previously about uh, the Vegas Star Academy and using some of these funds to potentially uh, start that pilot program. And then on the medical side, uh, we're looking at creating a, a health and wellness center on some of the underserved areas of our community. And we recently acquired a piece of land on the east side, and this would allow us to actually build that and start serving that community. Under the affordable housing side, uh, we're looking at the potential acquisition of multifamily complexes to create more housing opportunities for uh, income-based families. What we're finding is there, there's a lot of need out there, not just for folks that lose their house, but families that lose their house. And so when you look, for example, at our, at our courtyard, uh, while it may be okay for somebody that's by themselves there, it may not be proper for a family to be there. And so we're looking for opportunities to help those out. And then the acquisition of either BLM or private parcels for public-private partnership. As we talk to some of our, our partners in the home building industry, some of the challenge they have is the cost of land. And so when you try to provide affordable housing, when you factor in the high cost of land, it, it just doesn't pencil. And so there's an opportunity for partnerships where we can buy down some of that cost of land to make it pencil so they can sell those homes at an affordable price. And then increasing the housing inventory. We all know that there's a big need for additional housing here, and so how do we increase that inventory to do infill housing? And then repurposing some of our land. We may have some land that's underutilized, that's under city control. And so is there an opportunity to repurpose that for a higher and better use that helps, helps our community? Under the business assistance, uh, we're looking at partnerships to help business with the reopening, whether it's a marketing campaign or providing some of the services, getting people back to, to the business, helping be prosperous. Uh, we're looking for grants for business assistance, again, focusing on those industries that weren't directly served by some of these bills, but have the need to also be able to, to stand up their business, whether it's trying to bring employees back. Uh, the biggest challenge we're hearing out there is lack of sufficient employees, and so what can we do to assist with that portion there? The other thing we're hearing a lot of is those businesses that are opening, particularly in the downtown. Uh, in the Arts District, we're seeing a vibrant community come back, but one of the challenges there is the lack of parking. And so while people want to come down so they're successful, there's no place for them to park. So one of the thoughts is to increase the downtown loop service where people can park in the downtown core where we have parking structures that during the evening are empty and provide direct service with free, free travel down there. And then supporting business with, with technology. How do we help them implement technology that will help them with their, their operations? Under the uh, public pandemic response, uh, you know, we're noticing that the recuperative care center is a great demand for that. And just as a reminder, that's a facility that we build where folks that are homeless and have a need to heal would be able to do so. Uh, their injury may not be so severe that they be allowed to stay in the hospital, but they still need a place to heal. And so this recuperative care center is a facility that does that. Uh, we're looking at possibly an expansion of that and the backside of it to be able to have more capacity to, to help those folks. And then there's a real need in long-term long mental health facilities. Um, we hear it over and over again that a lot of the challenges we have is folks with, with mental illness and how can we provide support. The reality, this is a partnership that needs to happen with the state and Clark County because they're the lead agency to provide that support, but how can we be a partner in that and help with that? Under the revenue loss replacement, uh, one of the reasons the bill provided money for state and local governments was to help them bring back those services that had to be cut because of the pandemic, and those services specifically that are responsive to the pandemic. On our side, for example, we had to cut back on some of our fire services because we didn't have the funding to do that. And so how do we bring back, whether it's public safety, or whether it's health care, those services that we need to give to our community that, that require critical care. Uh, we still continue with vaccination assistance. We're still rolling out point distributions throughout the community, particularly our underserved areas, so it's more convenient for people to get vaccinated. And then homeless support is, uh, continues to be a challenge for us, and so how do we continue with outreach and support services to help those folks get in, into a better place? And then just modification of city facilities. How do we put better air clean systems so, so that the air is clean as it circulates through public spaces? And we're also looking at neighborhood support. A lot of the, our neighborhoods where folks were unemployed didn't have the ability to upkeep their homes because of lack of jobs, so we provide grants to help them do some maintenance and some upkeep of their facilities. So as we gather ideas, both either internal or from the community, uh, it'll go through an evaluation process. And this is a description of what it'd be like. We're in the process now, and it'll be in a continuous and ongoing process, but gathering those ideas from the community, what are those needs that we as the municipal government need to address? 
We'll evaluate those ideas against the priorities that council has adopted previously, but also what is the role of municipal government? Because one of the concerns I have is a lot of ideas come in, but are we the proper person to address that or should we refer that to the proper person, whether it's the state government, the county government who specialize those services? So we've got to be careful that we're providing the service that we best provide versus trying to take on something that's not our expertise, but instead direct those folks in the right direction. We'll, we'll evaluate these against the um, guidelines that were established by the Department of Treasury, and then the most appropriate use of funding. And so by the most appropriate use of funding, what I mean by that is in the bill itself, there's allocation that came directly to state and local governments. But there's also allocations in that fund that are specific to needs. There's money set aside for housing assistance. So if there's some money there, do we direct that need to that funding source versus state and local government, which we can use that money for other needs. And so we'll evaluate against that. We'll develop a specific plan and viable initiatives for all of these uh, different ones that as we, as we weed them out, see which makes sense. We'll identify who the lead agency is. Should it be us taking the lead or do we partner with somebody else and let them take the lead? Uh, we'll identify what the funding allocation needs are and what we are able to provide help with and then develop a rollout schedule, you know, whether it's going to be done in six months, a year, so that there's, there's an expectation of when these will be completed. Once we have that viable list, we'll be bringing it back to council so that you can approve those projects moving forward. And then we'll monitor the initiatives that progress goes up. Part of the requirements under this bill, Treasury requires that we establish metrics up front of what the intent is and how we're going to measure those performances. So we'll develop those metrics. And then we got to periodically report out to both the Department of Treasury and to you as City Council on the results. There's a report due to Treasury August 31st that first of all spells out what is your plan, your overall plan for this money, and we're in the process of developing that. And then also, what are the expenditures to date of this funding? We haven't had a lot of expenditures to date. We've, we've had some expenditures in paying for paramedics to be out there doing vaccinations, things of that nature, but no major expense. So we need to report out quarterly what those expenditures are, but annually, what is the plan and what is the progress of the plan? As far as community input, uh, we, we continue to have interaction with our community partners. We constantly get calls from folks saying, here's our need. We come in and meet with them and try to evaluate their needs. We tr track all that information. But we're also tracking all the feedback that's coming out from the various ongoing regional surveys and some of these town hall meetings. The Clark County had a series of town hall meetings last week and one yesterday. Uh, we have staff that are, are monitoring that because what we're hearing in, in our needs, our surveys are the same things they're hearing. And so when you look at it, the region as a whole has a similar need. And so the needs that are being brought to our attention are very similar to the needs that are in our community. So we're monitoring that to see what opportunities there are out there. And then we, we got a survey that's been online now for about a week, uh, and, and the link is shown here, where we're hearing feedback from the community. And so just to give you an update on where we are with that survey, uh, as of Monday, we had 235 uh, people that filled out the survey. Uh, here's some of the here's where he, things we're hearing on there. There's four really categories that are jumping to the top of where, we think, where people think the needs are. The first one being homeless and how do we address the homeless challenges that we as a whole region are having. Uh, the second one is on housing and affordable housing. We see folks that are currently in housing but the rent of their housing is starting to go up and they're concerned that they're no longer be able to afford it. Uh, we're hearing a lot about business assistance. There's businesses that are trying to open back up and they need help in doing that. And then we're hearing about mental health and the impacts that it's having. L at least there's an overlap on them. When you look at mental health and homeless, there's an overlap there. But those are the four things that are rising to, to the top on some of these uh, surveys that we're doing out there. And we'll continue the survey going on. We're also going to open up a period with a forum for people to submit requests for funding. And that will go online July 26th and will be online till August 13th. And the way people can get that is they just go to the city's main webpage. Right on the front page, there'll be a link. There'll be a box there with a link. And there'll be a pre-qualification form that they can submit and say, here's what our needs are, here's what we're asking for, so we can include them in the list of evaluation of things that we'll bring forward to council for your consideration. And so that's just an update of where we are with the American Rescue Plan. Just wanted to make you aware of that and be glad to answer any questions. Okay, any, uh, yes, Councilman Knudsen. Thank you, Mayor Portem. Uh, Jorge, I just wanted to say that I, I think your team has done a really good job. I, I've watched the state and the county and how they're rolling out, um, and I, I think the city's doing a really good job at how we are managing the process. Um, I just wanted to be transparent, the conversations that we've had. Uh, I think it's important for, for us to think through the city council priorities and how this funding could potentially apply to those. And so building out the, the medical infrastructure is a great way to diversify our economy. So I'll continue to think through those opportunities as they're presented and, and shuffle them through to your team. Um, but I, I like how this is 
playing out and I think that this is a really good time for the city of Las Vegas and the county and the state to build out the infrastructure to support some of these longer term needs that we've been talking about as a community for, for decades now. So uh, I just think your team is doing a really good job and I appreciate the opportunity to continue to engage in thinking through how we can leverage these dollars to build out the infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thanks. Councilman, Councilman Career. Thank you, Mayor Pro Temp. I, I just want to say great job and great presentation. Um, look forward to receiving the feedback from, more feedback from the public and, uh, and how we're doing this. Uh, one of the things that I just want to reiterate, and uh, you and I spoke about this, is as we start working with our partners and start working with other nonprofits that are out there, that we have, and you mentioned about metrics, that we have to report to the federal government, but we need to ensure that our partners have um, uh, clear goals and clear metrics of where these dollars and how it's going to contribute to better our community. And uh, we need to hold them accountable for that because sometimes government doesn't happen like that. We give uh, our partners dollars, they go do their work, and. And then they come back next year and then they say, we want to re-up our dollars. And many times we do that without saying, okay, so exactly what did you do? Um, how did you make a difference? Did you meet your goals? And I think people need to get more accountable towards that, even if they are nonprofits. Thank you. You're right, Councilman. It's very important. I think the way we do that is we've got to be very clear up front on what the expectations are. We're, we're giving money with these expectations, set those metrics, and then, as you say, monitor and hold them accountable. Yeah, also, also just to, to piggyback on that comment, I mean, I, I've seen stories where, I mean, there's so much money being being sent out by the federal government, and, you know, we're, we're going to use this, but um, you, you give money to somebody or some organization, and they go out and buy a boat with it, you know, instead of spending it. So are we, are we going to make sure that we're keeping an eye on, uh, I mean, we're, we're going to know where the money goes, but how it's going to be spent. I mean, we need to make sure we're auditing wherever this money goes to so it's not being used um, for personal reasons and it's being used for what they told us they were going to use it for. And that's a part of the uh, U.S. Treasury requirements. We are eventually responsible as a fiscal agent for the money okay. get allocated to us. So part of the requirement is we need to set up what those metrics are. We need to monitor it. And then we got to report back both to yourself and to Treasury saying here's the expenditures, what they were used for, and were they within the guidelines of Treasury. Okay. Councilwoman Diaz. Thank you, Mayor Pertem, and I am going to echo um, my colleague, um, Councilman Knudsen's comments and lauding you, your team in getting all of this for us and um, driving um, our cities and our services <laughs> forward in a thoughtful way. I did want to kind of comment that sometimes we're not hearing from the communities that need us the most. And so um, I know there's going to be a lot of workforce retraining or workforce needs. Um, some jobs may never come back um, to to people, to folks, and um, they may be a little bit harder to then reemploy. And so just wanted to put in for especially the, the areas of our city that were hardest hit by coronavirus and then their ability to stay employed. Um, we really need to be thoughtful and I don't know if there's a way that we can gather some data um, that shines light on the disparities, the disproportionalities um, of access to certain services um, in light of what just happened in this past year. So I just kind of say it would be nice to see if we can find a way to get a picture of what we have dealt with as a city in the past year and our constituencies and our residents, what they've been facing in the past year so that we can make those very um, intelligent investments in our community that will uh, pave the road for healthier, more vibrant community in the years to come. Yeah, we can certainly do that, Councilwoman, and intuitively kind of know where those areas are, but you're right, we need some harder facts of, of researching where the folks in certain industries were impacted the most and where their, their residency area is, because those, those are the areas that need the greatest assistance. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jorge. This thank was you. a report only. Um, item number uh, 67, set the date for any appeals filed or require public hearings. Uh, struck, <coughs> instruct the city clerk to set the public hearing dates and appeals from the City Planning Commission meetings and dangerous buildings or nuisance letter abatements. Will do, thank you. Thank you. Uh, citizen participation, citizen participation uh, during this portion of the agenda. 
uh, must be limited to matters within the jurisdiction of the City Council. No subject may be acted upon by the City Council unless that subject is on the agenda schedule for action. If you wish to be heard, come to the podium, give your name for the record. Amount of discussion on any subject, uh, as well as the speakers allowed, may be limited. This is your opportunity to address the Council, but the Council is not able to respond or engage in dialogue as there are um, uh, uh, are there any members of the public who wish to want to speak? So we'll set the timer at two minutes. So, uh, morning. Morning. Go ahead and state your name, please. Two yeah. minutes. Daniel Braisted, B R A I S T E D, a resident. Deep, um, I don't know if it's afternoon or morning. Uh, Mayor Pertam, thank you. I'm having trouble getting responses from the City Council. I've been, been very patient, and I think that's my fault. I think I need to be more aggressive, but I don't want to be. I know you guys are busy, I hear everything you do. Um, I asked, I was told that I could get a list of everybody who gets a copy of the agenda, whether it's emailed or mailed. And I requested a, a copy of that and no response. I could see a response as no or send us 20 bucks, but no response is rude. Uh, the individual in, in, in charge of coding, after he heard some of my comments, he called me on a Monday and I told him I'm interested in that stupid lot. Uh, at 7th and Bridger and Carson that, that's disgusting. And I asked to meet to the agent in charge of that, and he said, yes, she'll be back Tuesday. She came back Tuesday, called me, and said she'd contact me. Crickets. That's over a month, sir. That's not right. Uh, <clears throat> the individual in charge of the courtyard. Uh, we were going to meet. He was going to give me a tour, and then he called at the last moment and said he was going to El Paso for three weeks or so, and I said, okay, contact me when we get back. Again, crickets. Uh, for three years, I've been tr trying to get the building number on the building at the corner of 11 and Fremont. I've sent letters, I, the prior city manager, I, I, nothing. Uh, <clears throat> the mayor assigned, over time, has assigned four ladies to answer some of my questions. My first question to each one of them, on the list, of job descriptions, is there one to report things that aren't right in the city? Out of all four, none of them responded. The fifth one was a city attorney. He contacted me and says, no, there is nothing on the job description to report evil things in the city. That's part of your problem. If you haven't put the assignment on their job description, how are you gonna get a response? Okay, um, want, or hey, could you have somebody uh, around here that can they can talk to this gentleman and get his list and see if we can respond to his information. So let's, let's go ahead and have you talk to somebody and see what we can get you. Okay? I appreciate that. Thank you. I Thank appreciate you. you coming down. Uh, anyone else like to participate in citizen participation? Okay, I will close uh, citizen participation. Uh, now we're on to uh, Council emerging, emerging issues, a discussion regarding potential items for future City Council agendas. Any discussion must be limited to whether or not such proposed items shall be placed on a future agenda and no discussion regarding the substance of any such topic shall occur. And when up here have any emerging issues they would like to bring up? Okay. No emergency emerging issues. So now we are on to Council member recognition, uh, comments made by individual city council members during this portion of the agenda may be acted upon by the city council unless that subject is on the agenda and scheduled for action. Is there any member of the, who wishes to speak on this? We'll start with Councilwoman Seaman. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Some slides. So the girls uh, want to talk about the Sandpiper swim team update. The girls attended Team USA training camp in Hawaii through July 12th. They are now in Tokyo preparing for the opening of the Olympic Games this Friday. And this first picture is of Bella and Katie in their Tokyo accommodations. The girls have enjoyed the Team USA experience. They feed off the team environment and enjoy making new friends from across the country that they will work with to represent the United States. The girls completed a 1500 meter 
Erica's qualifying event for, for, for time test in training at Hawaii and all went best in practice times by over 30 seconds each. This has boosted their confidence and so we're just cheering for them. In this picture, you see the girls signing posters their fans made for them before leaving Hawaii to Tokyo. The Sandpipers events in Tokyo will be between July 25th and July 30th. I will share their results on my social media and have a full update for the August 4th City Council meeting. I want to wish the best of luck to not only the Sandpipers, but to all the Olympians from Las Vegas as they go for gold in Tokyo. Go Team USA. So uh, we had um, an amazing recognition at UMC. I had the honor of recognizing the incredible men and the women of UMC Trauma Center for the amazing job they did saving the life of Pastor Russ Smethers Wall. We focused on their actions with one patient. These or extraordinary people save many lives per day. Dream. Let's go to dream. I had the honor to provide certificates of recognition to these fine young men for graduating from Metro's dream program. I wish them great success in their journey ahead. I would like to give special thanks to officers Dante and Adrian for mentoring, Captain Fred Haas, Lieutenant Michelle Tavares, Sergeant Brian Leahy, and all the amazing men and women of the LVMPD Summerlin Area Command for their wonderful commitment to our community. Now I'd like to uh, bring all the animals, a few animals up for adoption at the Animal Foundation Pet Adoptions. We have Sheba, who is a female spade around six years old, looking for a home. We have Frank, he's adorable, he's a male neutered. Um, two years old, about 65 pounds. Then we have a few cats up for adoption. We have a male two-year-old, Midnight, about 14 pounds. Then we have the amazing Harry Potter, <laughs> who is three years old, and he's about 10 pounds. So if you're looking for a pet, please consider the Animal Foundation. These are just a few of their animals, but they have plenty more and they really need homes. So you can contact the adoption department either by email adoptions at animalfoundation.com or you can call them at 702-955-5901. And as you know, in Ward 2, every week we have Small Business Saturdays where we feature you on social media. And all you have to do is call us at 702-229-2420 or email my staff at ward2 at lasvegasnevada.gov. And we are happy to come out to your business and feature you in our newsletter and on our social media. So please contact my staff and we are going to come out and feature you. Our regular breakfast buzz and war to biz that have started back a couple months ago um, has been such a great success in meeting constituents. Our next one is Saturday, August 7th from 9 to 10 at Egg Works. Please RSVP because we have a limit of 30 people and it's Ward 2 at lasvegasnevada.gov and it fills up quickly. But we would love you to join us for breakfast and discuss issues in Ward 2 and the city of Las Vegas. If you have any issues or concern, please contact my amazing staff at 702-229-2420, or you can just email us at ward2 at lasvegasnevada.gov. To find out what's going on in Ward 2, just follow us on our social media at Victoria D. Seaman on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or you can follow us on LinkedIn at Victoria Seaman. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Councilman Creer. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Temp. I just want to reiterate, we are so proud of our Sandpipers and all the other Olympians, uh, including Vashti Cunningham, who's competing in track and field. Um, just as a note, a good friend of mine, Dwight Gravely, coaches one of the Sandpipers, and he grew up playing tennis, and he also swam. And it's just great to see all their hard work that they've put into it and the success that they've had. So let's go, Las Vegas, let's go America.
Uh, yesterday, the city of Las Vegas announced the launch of the Arrow, which is a free shuttle service that will connect the Courtyard Homeless Resource Center at 314 4 Master Lane to 19 essential public and private services sites across the valley. A specially wrapped 24-seat shuttle bus will operate on two distinct routes covering both the east and west sides of the valley. The two-route service, operated by Keldish Transit, will run seven days a week from 8.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m., with the first and last stop at the Courtyard Homeless Resources Center. The city cannot do this alone, and I'm grateful that Keldish is uh, making this possible for us. The City of Las Vegas is offering the senior computer basic classes at the new and beautiful Strong Future Technology Training Center located at 330 West Washington Avenue. The center offers a warm, friendly, and welcoming classroom environment inside of the Cox Innovation Center. And registration is required and space is limited, so to reserve your seat, please call 702-236-2114. Uh, you know, my office is constantly working to provide updates on city services, COVID-19 updates and happenings in and around Ward 5. If you want to be included in those updates, uh, please contact my office at 702-229-5443. Or you can always send an email to Tanya at tjacksonlasvegasnevada.gov. And don't forget, you can always follow us on social media on Twitter at Cedric Career, Instagram Councilman Career, and Facebook Councilman Cedric Career. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Fiore. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So we are going to start with our splash back to school Friday, August 6th from 5 to 7 p.m. Bring your bathing suits. It's going to be a splash. Um, we'll be giving away school supplies for the upcoming school year. Right now, we are looking for Tavares Chandler. He's only 15 years old. He's a male, 5'6", 130 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes, last seen around Decatur and Vegas. Please call Las Vegas Metro at 702-828-3111 and Nevada Child Seekers at 702-458-7009. And he could be suffering, um, Tavares could be suffering from uh, emotional distress and may require medical attention. So please keep your eyes open for this beautiful child. We are also looking for Ansley Lane. She's 16 years old. She's 5'8". She's 180 pounds, blonde hair, hazel eyes. She was last seen wearing a dark green shirt, uh, gray shorts with white tennis shoes. Um, she's also uh, suffering from emotional trauma and needs medical attention. So please, if anyone has seen Ansley, please call our Metro Police at 702-828-3111 or our Nevada Child Seekers 702-458-7009. We have our homeless success stories. Our client relocated from Hawaii to Las Vegas to seek a more affordable life. He quickly secured a position as a construction worker and received housing assistance through the um, help of Southern Nevada. He was injured on the job and retired with disability benefits. Due to the drastically reduced income and physical limitations, the client became homeless. He was directed to our courtyard for assistance, and case managers thoroughly assessed his situation. They, f they informed him of the resources and services available on and off sites. He became a volunteer with our own courtyard shortly after that. The client was enrolled after he met with flexible housing team who listened to his story and witnessed his direct involvement in impacting positive change. He moved into a flexible housing unit where he lived a quiet life and planned his next steps. He was soon able to establish himself independently and in April of 2021, the client exited the program after he secured his own place. And we have a happy, happy birthday, Oscar. So um, these are some of my favorite picks. And I will tell you, um, the picture of Oscar in the chair, I want to thank the Las Vegas Weekly. The photographer was Christopher DeVargas. And then the picture in the middle of Oscar and, and Tony Spilatro, um, that goes out to Sam Morris, Norm Clark. And my one of my favorites from a year ago is Oscar putting a little sign at the plaza where his office is in Oscar Steakhouse, and it says, I miss being the mayor, but it's better sleeping with her. That's from our Oscar Goodman. So happy birthday, Oscar. I hope you're having a fabulous time on the beach. We miss you. Very good. Thank you. Councilman Knutson. 
Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, and nice job today filling in for the mayor. Um, this week, my team and I will be at the Las Vegas Meadows Senior Living Community to conduct a pop-up outreach table with residents. And I want to thank our Senior Advisory Board member, Kathleen Beinstein, for her work in keeping our team updated on public safety and more in the area. And I look forward to hearing from residents and reconnecting on this month's issues for the Las Vegas Meadows community. And as always, we are available. That's my phone number or social media or email if you want to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman, Councilwoman Diaz. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And so I first want to encourage everyone to fill out our survey um, that our city manager just described. We have these ARPA funds, and it's important to hear from all of you. So if you have not voiced where you think the monies and the support need to go in our community, please go to cityoflasvegas.link backslash ARP. Um, we're going to try to see if we can flash the pictures that didn't come up during the last city council meeting. So there's the ribbon cutting of the newly installed playground equipment um, that we did in partnership with Fox 5 and the Super Build team and all the amazing sponsors that came together. And you can see all the smiling children that had fun that day. So we just want to make sure we shared that moment with you all. Um, I want to thank Pastor Hatch for an amazing um, annual event that he has uh, continued to do since 2008 with our mayor's support and vision of creating this citywide faith initiative and bringing all of our uh, faith community together to pray for our community as a whole. And so this um, event um, has reached out to over 120 ch churches that come together and and pray and um, just want what's best for our community. So we had our mayor there and the band was uh, really amazing, really had a great time. Appreciate the invitation at Fifth Street Historic School. Um, we also, with um, the partnership on the city side and Mi Familia Vota and the, church, the Light of the World Church on Eastern and Cedar, we were able to hold up a pop-up vaccination clinic on July 14th, and um, we're just trying to go every place where we know there is community and there's folks that still need this vaccination um, to have a higher, a higher uh, level of defense against this Delta variant that's out there. Um, Wanted to invite everyone to this next session that the Clark County Commissioners are putting together. So this is for the county's ARPA funds and how we may need them to invest. We know that the county is heavily social services. Um, so I think it's important as a community for us to share our, our input and our vision as to what the needs are. So we're having a bilingual session this Thursday, July 22nd, 5.30 to 7. Uh, again, it's at East Las Vegas Library at 2851 East Bonanza Road this Thursday. So I hope we can count on you and see you there. Spread the word with folks that may want to come out. Um, Want to also put on uh, our community's radar that we're having a free COVID-19 vaccination pop-up at the Universal Church. This one's unique because it's on Sunday, July 25th, and usually we don't really see them offered on Sundays. 4 to 8, 4824 East Desert Inn Road. Um, and hopefully if you know anyone who hasn't been able to make it work with their schedules, please share that Pfizer and, and Johnson & Johnson will be offered there. And the second shot for the Pfizer will be on August 15th, so the dates are already preset. And that's all I have today. Thank you very much, and I hope everyone's staying hydrated and cool. All right, thank you. And uh, that ends another successful city council meeting, and I just want to thank all my colleagues up here. and the communications and IT and the city clerk and our city manager and all the directors and city attorney and um, all our marshals out there. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, all right, we're adjourned. And we'll see you, when's the next meeting? Uh, August 4th. August 4th. We'll see you August 4th. Thank you very much. Good job. All right. Thanks.